Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vidya Mushahwa, and I would like to welcome all of you to this month's Smart Talks. If you are joining us for the first time, Smart Talks is a monthly seminar series of the Smart Network here at the University of Alberta. And as many of you know, Smart stands for Sensory Motor Adaptive Rehabilitation Technology. We are a network of more than 300 professors and learners who have come together from many different disciplines to develop interventions that would improve quality of care and health outcomes, especially for persons experiencing neurological conditions. And I am delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Russ Greiner. Uh, Dr. Greiner is a professor of computing science here at the University of Alberta and a founding researcher of the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, or what we know as AMI. He, uh, his work focuses on developing applications of machine learning in medicine to provide solutions for specific real world health uh, problems. And his goal is to develop data driven tools that uh, assist medical practitioners with screening, prognosis and treatment uh, planning for both physical and mental uh, health. Now, to give you a little bit about his background and professional activities, uh, Dr. Greiner received his PhD from Stanford and um, worked uh, in both academia and industry before joining the University of Alberta. He uh, chaired the International Conference on Machine Learning in the past and was the editor-in-chief of the journal Computational uh, Intelligence. He's received numerous honors and awards, um, including his induction as a fellow in the Association for the Advancement of Artificial uh, Intelligence. And he has supervised well over 100 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and published more than 300 peer-reviewed papers. So we're really very excited to have Dr. Greiner as our speaker today. Uh, before we hand um, uh, the reins over to him, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, this session is recorded. I encourage everyone to participate in the question and answer session at the end of the talk. But you could also you could also you can um, ask your um, question verbally at the end, or you can write your questions in uh, the chat as we go along, and I can ask your questions on your behalf from, at the end. And, and to preserve to preserve their bandwidth, um, please um, do turn your camera during the talk, but uh, turn the camera cameras back on at the end so we can uh, interact during the question and answer session. And with that, I hand it over to you, Russ. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this prestigious uh, series. Um, as you said, I'm a professor in computing science. I'm a fellow of Amy, and I'm also a CIFAR chair. Let me begin by talking about how exciting this time is right now to be working in machine learning for medical tasks. Almost every day, there's another article in the popular press that talks about a tool like Chesnut for diagnosing pneumonia that does better than human radiologists using a technique called deep learning. There's, Art there's Arteris, which is a medical imaging platform that helps doctors diagnose heart problems that's been actually cleared by the FDA for use. There's a tool called AKI for acute kidney injury that can detect symptoms two days before standard symptoms appear. Another tool was designed in China that can diagnose brain tumors to predict hematoma expansion that did better than senior clinicians did at this task. What I'm very proud of is a tool that I was a small part of the development of here at Edmonton, a urine test that screens for adenoma, pre-colon cancer. <clears throat> Anyone here who's over 50 will know what this device, this is. This tool does better than this fecal occult blood test. It's more accurate and less icky. And once again, it was developed here at Edmonton and it's being rolled out as we speak. That's in the popular press. If you want to go to PubMed and look, type in machine learning to its search engine, and you'll find some 68,000, 68,000 articles that involve machine learning. And there's also pretty obviously an exponential rise in the number of articles that involve this idea that have appeared in refereed medical informatics, medical journals. Of course, that's the world in general. I'm <clears throat> talking about my own personal trajectory. If I think about what I've been involved with over the, over the years, over the decades, um, 
I started by doing a few projects and over time I added more and more from cancers and tumors and transplants and diabetes. And two years ago, I decided not to say no when I got cold calls. I found a whole variety of other tools of other tasks that could benefit from machine learning. I've involved many of these that have led very successfully to, to papers, deployment, as well as grants. <clears throat> That's just in the medical applications. In general, machine learning involves finding and using patterns for data. <clears throat> so there's many examples of this. Multi-billion dollar companies like Google and Yahoo, Yahoo and Microsoft have machine learning as a core technology. It's not a peripheral thing, that's how the company works. There's many applications that they've used for like AdWords to try to find articles or products and identify the people. There's also things like Facebook and LinkedIn and Harmony that try to match people to people that have been very successful. <clears throat> Other applications, both with an Alberta connection, you may have heard about AlphaGo. This was developed by DeepMind people in England, but the primary driver, the person who instigated this, was one of our graduates, David Silver. I'm always proud to brag about him. Another article that was a cover of science <clears throat> was looking at, at the game of poker. My colleague, Michael Bowling did that. There's some big companies. Again, this is a partial list of just different areas that have involved machine learning over time that have been successful, or some are startups, but some have been gone beyond the startup phase. So that's all just motivation. That's just the, the wow here. This is the type of things going on. <clears throat> Let me say a little bit about what this is. I'm going to start by an example, a particular example of learning to predict breast cancer relapse using machine learning ideas. And that will allow me to introduce ideas like how it differs from standard biostatistics, why it's the difference in correlation and prediction is a key idea there. I'll then spend a bit of time talking about machine learning 101, some overview of algorithms, some idea about what evaluation means. And then as time permits, I've got a bunch of other things I've been involved with, that my colleagues have been involved with, other machine learning tasks in this medical context. And there's other topics as well, and you can see how time goes. So right now, I wanna talk about a medical task, learning to predict breast cancer relapse. Come on, Miles. So <clears throat> this is based on you know, a lay person's misunderstanding of the world. Um, as I understand the world, your cells in your body, and there's tissues that are formed by zipping cells together. There are these um, so-called cadhedron catenin complexes that stick through the cell membrane that hold cells together, and that forms the coherent tissues that sit together. Very useful by having these proteins that jut through the, the plasma membrane. When they're disrupted, <clears throat> two things happen. One thing is often they seem to no longer be doing their job. They're no longer, they move to the cytoplasm, the nucleus, other parts of the cell, which means they're not holding it together, they're not zipping the tissue together. Even worse, <clears throat> they seem to interact with some growth regulatory proteins and modify the function. And that may trigger metastasis for some cancer cells. So again, that's all the all the medical things I understand, I try to understand, but this idea that understanding where these particular proteins are may be related. So the challenge I said was, suppose we told you, Russ, <clears throat> the location of these so-called junctional proteins within a breast cancer tumor cell, whether it's in the membrane, in the cytoplasm nucleus, I tell you, prior to any treatment, can we use that to predict whether the patient will have a relapse within three years? So we could do this, well, if we understood a patient would have a relapse, that might suggest a treatment to apply. That might also indirectly help research identify markers or pathways or new drugs. But again, I'm going to focus on just the machine learning part. Can we predict the early relapse? So now let me tell you about my world. This is a world I live in. <clears throat> so here you go, Russ. We'll give you 66 historical patients. For every patient, we'll give you some 30 features. These characteristics of every patient, well, there's these canhedra-mediated adhesion complexes. It's a mouthful. For alpha-catenin, is in the membrane, in the cytoplasm, or the nucleus. And the same for beta-catenin, and you can hear it in, in these six complexes, concentrations. 
There's also these other things, how old a patient with the size of the, of the, of the tumor, and other things like um, concentration of P10, just another sort of celebrity protein. So these are important things. <clears throat> But even more important is what happened to these women. These are historical women. Some had a relapse within three years and some did not. So this is a world that, that I live in. What do you do with this data? Well, <clears throat> one thing you could do, and one common thing is, say, let's try to, let's try to figure out correlation patterns. Oops, I'm sorry. <clears throat> For example, can I figure out from this, I should knock out this gene or amplify this this uh, substrate. So this is important. So they take the same this data, and they find they find correlations. How is each one of these correlated with the outcome? And they find things which are highly correlated or negative correlated, the p values, whatever it is. And those are things that seem to be related to the outcome. And that suggests a study. Let's try knocking this out or amplifying that. Great work. Important to do this. <clears throat> Let me give a caricature between sort of the core biostatistics approach versus the machine learning, supervised machine learning approach. Similar goals using historical data to understand this phenomenon, but a different emphasis. Biostatistics typically looks for correlations, like what proteins are to the outcome. And machine learning, supervised machine learning, has a different objective. I want to make a prediction for a novel individual. So what does that look like? Not this question. But different question. <clears throat> Here's a patient talking to a clinician who says, will I have a relapse? And the clinician wants to give an answer, an an a truthful answer. Hopefully the answer is no, but at least a response. So how do you do that? How do you make a prediction for an individual? <clears throat> well, one approach is look at a number of lymph nodes. We could use that and say, for example, any lymph nodes predict relapse, no lymph nodes predict no relapse. Okay, well, that's a technique. So of course, that's only one of the 30 features what, what about beta catenin in the nucleus? Let's look at that. Build a model and say, <clears throat> well, that's one test we could run. Or maybe we could look at, oh, no. at the size of the tumor. Maybe that's correlated with the relapse. <clears throat> sort of features you could look at. I want to make a comment here. Correlation of beta catenin nucleus. That number looks like zero. I'm going to come back to that later on. Keep going. So we can look at age of diagnosis or P10. So all these are saying, I'll look at a single feature, find a feature, which is going to give me some insights about whether there be relapse or not. But why one feature? Why not a combination of many features? So again, going back to my caricature, <clears throat> again, much of our statistics is a simple correlation of individual features, and much of it's just single outcome, single features. Again, um, well, many of my colleagues are biostatisticians. They know a lot about the technologies, just the main focuses here. Machine learning is trying to get predictors, not correlations. And the way the predictors work, they tend to be multivariate. Find a combination of features that collectively predicts the outcome. So again, that's where we're coming from. So the goal here is, here's a patient. <clears throat> There's these 30 features for this patient. Classifier is a tool which says, given this, this characteristics, identify whether the patient has a relapse or not. Now, it would be wonderful if medical science had reached a stage where we understand all the mechanisms of how proteins and cells and metabolites interact. And they could figure out that if there's this many alpha catenin in the nucleus, but not that many, but the P10 varies not that big, and the woman's this age, and yada, yada. Now, I understand how the mechanisms work, and therefore, there'd be no relapse. That'd be wonderful. I strongly encourage the world to reach a state like that. And again, the wonderful work that biostatisticians is contributing a lot to this technology to figure out what's important and then do studies and so forth. That would be great. We're not there right now. <clears throat> How can we possibly build a classifier that gives an answer when we don't understand the mechanism? Remember that data set I mentioned? These 66 patients with 30 features and the outcome? Again, we knew the outcome for these historical patients, so that's all great. Machine learning is a way to take this data and produce a classifier that can then give the answers for novel individuals. That's what machine learning is all about. So how do you do this? Well, we try to find patterns, relationships between the features and the outcome collectively. 
<clears throat> let me sort of motivate why this could be possible by a simple example. Imagine I could visualize number of lymph nodes and age of diagnosis. This is made of data, of course. And now I've got every patient, every mark here is a patient. Some who did not have relapse, some who did. And then along comes this patient. And now the question is, what about this one? What's the label for this individual? Uh, true, she will relapse, or false, she will not. So that's, that's a prediction task. <clears throat> I think if I were, if this was a live audience, I would ask for comments. I think most people would say, well, of course it's, of course it's yes. You know, how could it not be? <clears throat> Let me put it, this is just an educated guess. It wasn't based on a post-mortem or definitive test, but I think most people would feel pretty confident in this. It really is, you know, the argument, look, you know, surrounded by the pluses and there's no negatives nearby and yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> so you might actually make a decision on this basis and give a treatment based on this. Well, <clears throat> if learning was this easy, I wouldn't have a job, right? This was an easy case when it's sort of, well, a good separation. What about this case? Still two dimensions, just two characteristics, but <clears throat> this guy, yes or no? I can tell a story that it's yes, because look, there are nearby patients this way, that's it, where it was yes. What about this direction? I can see stories where it's no also. Uh, it's not so clear. What's the right answer? Well, let's come to that a bit later on, but it certainly isn't obvious what should happen. That's just two dimensions. What if you have three dimensions? What about this patient now, where you can sort of, you can sort of visualize it, but at least you can, can visualize it with three dimensions. Uh, the data set I just mentioned, that was 30 dimensional. How do you visualize that? Why don't you tell me you're comfortable 30 dimensions? I'll give examples where it's 60 dimensions are examples with, with um, uh, metabolites, which are again, 80 to 60 to 80 dimensions. If you're comfortable with that, we'll talk about examples where there's tens of thousands of dimensions for microarray, or I'll give examples from brain imaging where it's arguably 7 million dimensional. You can't visualize it, but maybe the same tools that work for things we can visualize will apply and generalize this more abstract tasks, which are very realistic because that's where the data really is. So that was some motivation. I, I gave a motivated situation. I gave a simple example. <clears throat> On to machine learning 101. Let me give some simple algorithms at a high level and then talk about evaluations after that. <clears throat> One simple algorithm is called a linear separate. Linear line separate, right? So pluses here, minuses are. So again, here's a redrawing of, of a new situation. Here would be easy. You know, put a line at, at 1.5, you know, any more than one positive, so yes, I would say no. <clears throat> that's a, a line that separates it very nicely. And there's a very simple classification rule. Number of lymph nodes more than 1.5, say yes, you know, predict relapse, otherwise predict no relapse. So this guy here would be positive, would be a relapse. So that's a straight line. That's a axis parallel, horizontal or vertical. It's easy to visualize. What about this guy? Well, if you remember your linear algebra, you might know the formula for a straight line is just a linear combination of the coefficients. So this line might be, for example, age of diagnosis times 7.5 plus lymph nodes times 1 point plus time, I'm sorry, negative 2.3 times age of diagnosis plus 7.5 times lymph nodes plus 1.2 equals zero. That's what this line would be. And this line, I could say positive here, negative there, it can be easy to see that this is a little rule. Give me a linear combination of these different features. Say yes or no based on that. Straightforward. <clears throat> okay. So in general, right, you have different features. You want to find the weights. But let me let me know this picture. So here's a game. <clears throat> I've got a whole bunch of characteristics. Um, I've learned these weights. And now when a, when a patient comes in, a patient comes in. Oops, and who has these characteristics, whatever these things mean. And I then do a computation, you know, number of lymph nodes times 2.3 and age of diagnosis times negative 35. And I add them up one times 2.3, 35 times negative 7.5, blah, 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 times negative three times 21. And that sum obviously is 48, 46.8. Is that bigger than zero? Yes. And that's our answer. So at performance time, given a new instance, I predict a label. Of course, at learning time, when I have this data set, 
given this label data, I now try to find a way through doing it. So that's a challenge. So how do you do this? There are many linear algorithms, many algorithmic linear separators. One of the most popular is something called support vector machine. Now let me describe what this guy does. Again, here are some examples in two-dimensional space. You know, it's positives and negatives. I can just show you. Um, so it's your one line at a time. So this one is a linear separator. If you look at it, you can see clearly blues are here and reds are there. And so is this one. Blues are there, reds are there. This, I can keep going, right? That one also true. All these guys here are all linear separators. They're all the right properties. Reds here and blues there. Which one of these is the best one? Again, if there was a live audience and a show of hands, and the be someone says, well, it's obvious, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's this guy. And why is this? Well, they give a standard answer, right? <clears throat> Look at purple. If this guy here moved over a teeny, teeny, oh, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, so this guy here, if he moved over a teeny bit, then he'd have a different label. And uh, assuming for, for brown, this guy's is pretty pro. This green line has this great property that it's robust. It's far from everything. There's nothing close to it. And that's a desirable feature. And it's called, it's actually called the margin, right? The margin is a distance from this decision boundary to the nearest point. So it'd be like, this is the nearest point, that's the nearest point. I want to make that margin, that nearest distance, as big as possible. So that's the margin. I want to find the line. But then all the points, I want to find the line with the property that it makes that margin as big as possible. And that's the goal. It turns out <clears throat> that's what these guys are, the support, the vectors that support this line. That's what's called a support vector algorithm machine. And it does exactly that. And the good news is, if the data is linear, linearly separable, then there's a fast algorithm using quadratic programming that will find this best possible straight line. All well and good. We solved all the machine learning, right? I can find the best linear separator, but there is a catch. He said, if the data is linearly separable, but you know, back in the 60s, some people observed this uh, uh, problem. So I want to find a linear separator. Here's two dimensional space, just four points. Find me a line with all the positives here and all the negatives there. This, this one is fine, you know, that's plus on this side. And there's two negatives here, but there's also a plus here. So this is not, this line does not separate the data. That's fine, this is like one line. There's a gazillion other lines, right? I could try moving around. And if you're watching it carefully, you see wherever it moves, there's always gonna be, one side might be pure, but the other side will have both positives and negatives on it. And well, what about moving over here, right? So I can try this place. Well, this is fine. There's nothing here, but that doesn't work. Maybe I could, oops. Right. Trust me, you know, the bottom line is uh, <clears throat> there are data sets like this trivial data set, which is not linearly separable. This wonderful theorem that says we solved the problem did have this very strong caveat, the data being linearly separable. And most data sets are not. There are extensions to linear separators that can do it, but Let's talk about another class of algorithms that are also very effective. Given data, so this is called decision trees. And there's a bunch of fields that have all invented this technology. Let me describe what goes on here. So here's our data. <clears throat> it first finds a split. And it then says, okay, fine, I'm gonna split it in two. Are we done? No, we're not done yet. Let's try, let's try to find another split. Maybe if I split it there, now we're done. That's all negative, good. That's all positive, good. That's all negative. Oh, we're not done yet. So maybe another split, we'll keep going. I keep splitting and splitting until I get to, to purity. So that's the idea. <clears throat> it's, a, uh, it's a recursive partitioning algorithm that would end up being a little decision tree, a hierarchical split, divide and conquer. You know, first ask if the temperature is more than 35, and if the answer is no, I then ask is the blood pressure greater, again, made up numbers. Is, is this greater than 80? If the answer, if it is greater than 80, then say no. If it's less than 80, say yes. What about the other case? If it's greater than 35, then ask about blood pressure and keep going. So this would be an example of a decision tree. 
<clears throat> so there's some magic here. You know, how do you split? How do you stop? I have a, a little tool that we invented, uh, a little website that uh, talks about how to split, when to stop, how to avoid overfitting, and so forth. But just that's a decision tree. So I mentioned decision trees because here's a decision tree that we that a learning algorithm, not, not Rust, but an algorithm we ran on that data, produced this tree. <clears throat> And this tree was something that used certain features and gave an answer. So we can talk through this tree. This says, look at alpha cat in the nucleus. It shouldn't be in the nucleus, right? It's supposed to be in the membrane. It's, it's going rogue. So if any is, is in the nucleus, that's a bad, bad thing, say relapse. If there's no alpha cat in, in the nucleus, fine. Ask how many lymph nodes. Lots of lymph nodes, no more than zero, say relapse. OK. <clears throat> Oops, I'm sorry, I should be here. Uh, if, if number of lymph nodes is zero, we're not done yet. Ask about P10. If the concentration of P10 is really large, then predict no relapse. And maybe this will undo the damage of the alpha catenin. If the number of relapse, if the number of P10 is very small, now say there will be a relapse. It's not, it will do its job. It'd be a story you could tell. If it's equal to two, right in the middle, then use beta catenin in the nucleus. And now it's a little bit counterintuitive by, by how it does it, but it ends up saying if there's none of the nucleus predictor relapse, and otherwise, predict, and otherwise, if there's none of the nucleus predictor relapse, otherwise, say no relapse. It's a little counterintuitive, but there's our tree. <clears throat> now, do you remember 10 minutes ago, I mentioned this beta cat in the nucleus, and I said its correlation was like zero, but there it is in my best tree. It came through that. So I now talk about a few algorithms, linear separators for vector machines. This is called the kernel trick for getting around the linearness of it. You may have heard about deep nets. Well, and so it's artificial neural nets, the whole technology for that. There's Bayesian classifiers or term probabilities, there's nearest neighbor. There are ways to combine simple classifiers to get better ones, like boosting and bagging and stacking. <clears throat> you can do more than just yes, no answers. You could give okay and sick and very sick or give real values. <clears throat> if you're interested in stuff, talk to me. There are classes on machine learning that cover one semester and just scratch it. Now we have a three semester series that covers it. That still isn't everything has to say about it, but it gives an idea that typing's going on. Let's keep going. <clears throat> that was the algorithms. At this point, you just say, wait, you gave me a tree should I use it? I mean, it didn't quite make sense to me. Is this really giving me a good answer? Let me talk about evaluation. because That's a critical part of machine learning. <clears throat> First question, what is the goal of learning? There is my training set. If the goal of learning was just to do all the training set, I'm done. I know that A was no, and B was yes, and D was no. I can just memorize the data. That's not the point. The goal is to do well on data you haven't seen to do well in data like this guy who's from the same distribution, but unknown class. So it's got a guess, it's got to be effective on things it hasn't seen yet. How, could, how is that possible? Just to repeat that, right? Uh, a goal is a classifier that predicts correctly on novel patients like this woman. And critically, she is not in the historical patients. So it's guessing, you know, is it magic? How is this possible to work? So let me tell a story. Why should machine learning work? So imagine I care about this breast cancer uh, relapse question. I open up a clinic here in Edmonton and a bunch of patients walk through the door and I collect that data and I get to see what happens later on. And then I'll run a learning, a learning algorithm with data D to produce a classifier. And by construction, this classifier that's based on running the learner on the data it's designed to do well on that data. So along comes another, a new patient. You know, I'm still in Edmonton, still in the same population visiting the clinic. And I want to know, <clears throat> is this classifier that did well in D, is that going to do well on this new patient? So let me talk through two cases. Case one, suppose X is a common case. Let's, be, let's make it, suppose I have 200 examples here and X is a type of, type of women who occurs about one time in 10. It's, you know, it's a familiar case. If X, if this patient occurred one time in 10, this data set of 200 people probably has 20 people who look like her. 
If it did bad, badly on women who look like this, that's a 10% hit right there, which means that a, a class that does well on the training set will do well in the common cases. So this is a woman who occurs common case. If it did well, that means it, it would take a 10% hit. If it did well, it probably didn't get it wrong, which means it probably does well on X. So common cases means similar patients have appeared, which means a, a, data, a classifier that's based on that data set was probably gonna be correct on space. That's one bit of good news. Of course, not every case is common. <clears throat> what about a case that occurs one in 10,000 times? What about a case that's just never, that occurs very, very rarely? The data set probably is no women who look like this woman. That doesn't mean it's not gonna work, it just means the guarantees that we have don't apply, that we can't, we might miss it. Again, <clears throat> this is not a statement about machine learning, this is statistics, this is just the way the world works. Rare cases occur rarely at training time and they'll occur rarely later on or toward the more relevant direction. Something that occurs rarely at performance time, I might not have seen at training time. And that's, and that's true for medical residents, right? Who learn from books and they follow a clinician for years and they see the cases the clinician has seen. That clinician also may not have seen a one in 10,000 case. So that means that, <clears throat> that the classifier might be wrong. But if you look at all the cases that are one in 10,000, that still adds up to not that much. So the classifier will do well in the common cases and do poorly on ones that weren't common. And that's unfortunate. I would rather do perfectly on everyone, of course. So would clinicians, but also they haven't seen all cases either. So again, this is just the way the world is. It's gonna make mistakes. The mistakes it makes are gonna be on the infrequently observed case because they weren't part of the training set. So <clears throat> with that in mind, how do you evaluate a classifier? So you could, <clears throat> again, I already talked about, you could train on a data set to produce a classifier. But then evaluate on the same class of, on the same trained data, but that is a problem. It's going to be optimistic. And let, let me explain why that's a problem. <clears throat> um, Vivian probably didn't tell you there's going to be a test on this next part. You didn't mention it, right? <clears throat> that's okay. uh, and now today as well, to pretend this wins. So imagine I say the test is this is next Friday, but just to make life interesting, here's a fine I'm going to give you. There you go. You get to look at it. And there are the answers, by the way. Look at the final. You got it. Study it. You can hand it back. Now, here it is next Friday, and there is the same test. Go for it. Who here thinks this is going to be an accurate reflection of how well you understand the material? Okay, there's no way to show hands, but most people say, of course not. This is not going to reflect it. You can just memorize it and get it. This is exactly testing on the training data. It's a bad idea. You get optimistic results. There's so many papers that caught that do this, which annoy me, but that's my problem. Right? So now what I want is to, is to train on not the test data, but on data that's kind of related to it, but not the test of the So test is still next Friday, but it, here's a test I gave four years ago. And there are the answers. Study that and then hand it back. And now I give you the real test. There you go. And now it's going to be accurate reflection. So this sort of motivates this idea of having, of having a training set and a disjoint test set, sets I didn't train on to get a more accurate evaluation. And this idea called <clears throat> cross-validation, which puts this idea and makes a very standard algorithm. So there's our label data. The, there's a data, there's a label. And a learning algorithm runs on this and produces a decision tree. I'm calling it beta, just give it a name. So that's my decision tree. And now, how good is that? Well, I, I, I'm not gonna test on the same data, but what if I ran the same learner on a similar data set? So for example, I can use four-fifths of the data and run a learner on four-fifths of that data. And I get a, a model which is probably pretty similar. It's a, it's data, it's a, a classifier that was trained on the same type of data. But I wonder how good beta one is. If only I had data from the same distribution, that wasn't what I trained on. Oh, there we go, right there. So I can evaluate it. I can find the error of this classifier train of four bits of data on the remaining subset that wasn't part of the training set. So I can get that. That's a, pre that's a pretty good estimate of how good this data would work. 
I can keep going though. Why use this far fifth of data? I've got five different fifths of data to use. I can do this five times. Every time I use four fifths of data to build a classifier, and then the remaining fifth, the held out set, to give, it a bit, to give it error. And then I take the average of these numbers. And that's my model. That's my estimate of how good this learner would do on that data. This is five-fold cross-validation. You can imagine what 10-fold cross-validation or leave or not cross-validation all from the same framework. So just to reinforce another point, <clears throat> resubstitution error is if I train the tiny test on training data. Here, I just tried building classifiers based on all 30 different individual features. And if I look at the data I trained on and compare it to how well it works on the, how well the, my test on training data, I get this curve. And if I look at a held out set, just cross validation, I get different numbers, which often give a significant difference. Okay. So <clears throat> again, I'm running out of time, so I'm a little bit faster. Just there are lots of tricks we can use to get high resubstitution error, but don't actually work if I'm looking at a held out set. So we actually find that you can get like seven nights. This, this particular decision tree I showed with this cross validation result ended up being the, um, the most accurate of the different classifiers. Okay, and that was published, wow, 12, 13 years ago. So that was one example, using subcell localization and proteins to make a prediction. There are many other applications. This was for breast cancer, using clinical features and histology for prognostic tasks. Uh, <clears throat> but there's other application areas that I've been working on uh, for brain tumors and colorectal cancer and prostate oh, Why did you do that? For, and prostate cancer, um, sorry. And for psychiatric diagnoses and for strokes and cardiovascular. And you heard about COVID, there's some results we've done recently about COVID forecasting as well as transplantation. And the features, well, there's electronic health records and OMICS data, imaging data. The task can be prognostic, but also for screening. You know, I already mentioned the one for screening for uh, adenoma, for screening for uh, colorectal cancer uh, <clears throat> using, um, uh, using, using metabolomic profiles. So that's a, a screening test, diagnosis, treatment management. And there's some interesting questions. In addition to publications in the medical literature, there's some foundational questions that machine learning people are very interested in. High dimensional data. You know, again, we talked about 30 dimensions. I'll give some examples of larger number of dimensions. That's a real challenge to avoid overfitting. Uh, combine multiple data sets from different hospitals that have their batch effects and covariate shift issues. <clears throat> there's also this issue of counterfactuals, right? A given patient gets a treatment, and we know what happened. What if he, that patient got a different treatment? Well, we're never going to never know, but if I want to make treatment decisions, it'd be nice to have a data set which pretends I knew that. How do you cope with that, the causal issues and so forth? And I'm very excited these days. Maybe I'll invite Beck to give a talk about survival prediction is something that has a lot of interesting questions. So <clears throat> I'm here in my accordion slides. Right? I guess I have another five minutes. Is that about right? Uh, you can have uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, thank you. <laughs> 15, no, no, I'll take that. <laughs> so uh, let me talk about a few things here and then we'll jump to the end. <clears throat> so metabolomics is another very important area. I met you know, Alberta, I worked with Dave Wishart, who's a brilliant brain scientist, who sort of helped found the whole field of metabolomics, who created the Human Metabolome Database, which has tries to quantify metabolites that appear in the body, exogenous and endogenous, and find associated with treatment. So we did a few projects. One is cachexia. So this is a disease, <clears throat> many patients with cancer, un uh, unfortunately, oh, that they end up being unable to metabolize certain things, and they end up wasting away. Can we predict which patients with cancer will have this, will have cachexia or waste away? So we collect the urine sample, do an animal spectrum, uh, compute the metabolic profile of this individual, uh, which is kind of classic given this metabolic profile. Can I predict whether this person will have good text, yes or no? How do you do this? Well, I happen to have a data set of 74 patients and 54 features. And it turns out it's about 82% accurate. And this was published uh, um, 11 years ago. It was cool stuff. I already mentioned the colon cancer, the colonoscopy test that has these icky things about being um, uh, a fecal test. Anyway, so there's another metabolomic, uh, metabolomic profile. 
a urine test that can do better than any of these tests. And we can show this by AEC curves as well as cost curve analysis. And that was published eight years ago. Again, that led to the work I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> um, sure, let's go to microarrays. So what about expression level? So let me tell you an interesting story that I'm sure everyone here knows. <clears throat> um, your body has dozens, hundreds of different types of cells. There are cells in your eye, cells in your lung, cells in your skin, cells in your heart. They all are fundamentally different. But what's really weird is even though they're different functions, different types of cells, pathologists can look at this and say where this cell came from. There's only one blueprint that produces all these different things, DNA. How can one blueprint simultaneously produce all these things? How can one blueprint you know, produce this cup and, and these glasses and also this pen? Well, the answer when you think about it isn't too difficult. Uh, different parts of the blueprint are used. You know, one part's for a cup and a part's for a pen and so forth. Some of the different parts of the DNA are being used to lead to the, the, the generation as well as the expression for eyes and for lungs and for so forth. So a microarray, or more, measures what part of the DNA, which genes are being read. And that can distinguish different types of tissues, different types of cells. But it also can distinguish whether it's tumors or not, whether it's a cancer expressing different parts. And different tumors in different, uh, involve different regions of the DNA. So maybe a microarray could help understand different types of cancer. So <clears throat> I'm sure many people know that breast cancer is uncontrolled growth of cells in a breast, but it's really many different diseases which are fundamentally different. And the best treatment depends on which sub-disease and this thing called hormone receptor status. And those treatments have been identified for ER positive women, tamox uh, tamoxifen is a, a, a drug of choice. For ER positive, trituzumab works. So again, knowing the different ER status and different status is really important. So again, unfortunately, <clears throat> pathologists are overworked and there are mistakes that are made in Halifax and in, and in other places around the country. Again, pathologists are overworked and so could build a tool that would help them to avoid making mistakes. So can we use the same idea? Here's a microarray, do a biopsy, uh, create a, a DNA with 33,000 genes or probes in general per patient. <clears throat> and now, look at that this a genetic profile for each woman, and then have a classified terms for ER status. How do you do that? Well, it turns out there's some 160 women, all uh, 33,000 dimensional data, I have the outcomes. So learning how to work with this task also. I should point out that the earlier examples that deal with metabolites and, and other, other small set of features you know, if I've got you know, thousands of instances and dozens or even a hundred different features, we know how to do that. But now if I take this, turn it sideways, if I've got huge number of instances, huge number of features as well as instances, the world's more complicated. So <clears throat> it's called the large P small N problem. And then we tried a bunch of things, biological naive and clustering graphical models. And push comes to shove, we ended up coming up with a good answer for this. Um, eight years ago, I got to be on the news with John Mackey, and it was kind of fun for that. <clears throat> um, then breast cancer SNPs, brain tumors, psychiatric disorders. Uh, let me jump to, to this one, just sort of towards wrapping up. So <clears throat> psychiatric disorders, right? Many psychiatric disorders look similar. Depression and bipolar often are very similar presentations. But very different treatments. Do you want a mood stabilizer for bipolar, for mood elevators for depressed patients? It makes a difference. Also, within the same diagnosis, different patients respond differently to a given treatment. So, how can you build individualized treatments that are relevant across diseases and within a, within a disease population? So, one approach is using fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to distinguish disorders. <clears throat> this is a bunch of work that we've done. I'm going to skip lots of details, but lots of papers there. Um, come on. Okay. <clears throat> That's weird. Okay. So I think for reasons of time, I'm going to just say there was a competition, the ADHD competition. I think I'm going to skip this just sort of say that we actually did well. We actually won the competition, but we didn't use fMRI data for subtle reasons. And I 
test out the organizers, but but anyway, we end up getting some papers shot also. But I want to get talk about there are things like functional connectivity as another thing that um, that I wanted to describe that, right? So for every given voxel in the brain, you can look at the at the waveform. This is looking at intensity at a bold signal. So you can look at a pattern like that for this this part of the brain. Another part will have another pattern. And it turns out they're highly correlated, it's 0.84 these two regions. So we can build an arc between these two regions that have 0.84 there. Uh, for other regions, there might be very different correlation and maybe even you would argue not correlated at all. And do this for many different regions. Okay, I'll skip the details, <clears throat> but you're getting a very accurate model that uses like 73% accurate. Um, and we got some eye candy. So find the regions that seem most related to feature selection for that. Okay. Uh, and again, got the news. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip all this okay. our article uh, in uh, different languages. I'm going to skip to found, uh, one, one final thing. <clears throat> Some interesting questions are about um, how to do analysis. So, how many people know Kaplan Meier curves? I see everyone's. The Kaplan Meier curve is for a population of 128 patients. We look at the survival probability. How many patients live a certain length of time? So I can read off that 50% of the patients lived 11 months. And this is a wonderful tool for analyzing a population. This is the median time. This doesn't say for Mr. Smith how long he'll live, but it just gives an idea of how bad this disease is. Okay, let's get that, let's get that. But there can be huge, oh, that's weird. But there can be huge heterogeneity within a population. The median time was 11 months. <clears throat> but if I were to look at different patients, uh, here are two patients from the same population. Um, when I've got other covariate, you know, they both are stage four stomach cancers, but I've got other factors, I can make predictions for these different patients. So for this patient, uh, from Mr. 13, 14, I think he's gonna live 24 months, uh, 21 months, not 11. So you probably will see his son's wedding. Unfortunately, Ms. 13, uh, Ms. 1523 will live only about 2.2 months. She should be in hospice now. We can make predictions that do that. Lots of stuff about survival prediction. And we can also use it for, for liver transplants, who to wait list, and there's various tools for that. There's a website that people are using now for that. And skip, 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 skip. Okay. <clears throat> Let me go to the very end um, and just say um, <clears throat> lots of application areas I'm looking at. Um, there's Amy, which is our center. We're very interested in many tasks, including machine and health informatics. And I want to just end by saying, I'm a computer scientist. All this medical stuff, I don't know nothing about it. But I've got world-class colleagues to play with who are delighted to interact with uh, and try to find application areas. For Kexia, for um, unfortunately, Richard Fedor is no longer with us, but he was an instrumental in designing these tools. And, people, liver transplants and diabetes and so forth. These are tremendous people. I encourage you all to, to interact with these guys because they're wonderful. Final slide, association studies are very useful for finding causal connections, but they're not designed to predict patient outcome. If that's what you want to do, produce patient outcome, make predictors or classifiers, then predictive studies are necessary for that. And machine learning is designed for using those tools, which is critical for many years in bioinformatics and medical informatics. Skip that and just end with this slide. Okay. Uh, that's how to reach me. That's the word cloud. There's a, a other version of talk with more content there. And I'll stop here. Sorry for being a little bit over, but. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Ross. I, I don't think that uh, we can have enough. <laughs> and and we, could, we could have had this a uh, three hour talk and I, I, and I think everyone would still have uh, uh, yeah. Uh, been asking for more. So thank you so much for this uh, very, very exciting work. Um, let's jump into the questions. We uh, already have um, a couple of questions from uh, John uh, Ralston, and I'll ask him on his behalf. Um, first question uh, is, where do random forests fit in the map of algorithms? Maybe you can tell us what random forests are for those who don't know that, and then, um, and then uh, address the question. Okay. <clears throat> So there are many technologies for building these things. I described linear separators, part vector machines. Random forests are like decision trees, 
but you produce not one tree, but multiple trees uh, to do the same thing. Move my screen or something up. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry, I'm looking at my cameras. Are, so yeah, we, they're can, designed, we can see you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they're, they're designed to build classifiers or, or regressors to give real values in the output. They work very well. Uh, there's a lot of random forests that are arguably the tool of choice for many application areas. Um, so just one of many tools to have in your in your quiver, you know, when you want to solve a problem, have random forests as one because they do work very effectively. And there's arguments for why they work in terms of bias and variance and so forth. Yeah. But, yeah. So there's a uh, there's a also another question from John, um, where uh, it's related to uh, conditions that are not common, and he's asking whether you can create synthetic data to help improve classifiers for these cases that are not common. Good question. How do I build a how do I get this synthetic data? If I understood the world well enough to produce synthetic data, which is meaningful, which is, matches the world, then I'm, I'm done. I could also, the synthetic data could automatically produce the answer. So I have this much data to play with, I can build a classifier. I take this much data and using that, find more data that looks like it, but there's no more information. Mm. It's this much information I start with and having synthetic patients with synthetic answers is just my model of the world. Now there are some exceptions, but it, there are exceptions like if I know, if, if someone comes down and says, I tell you ahead of time that men and women are identical. So I could have synthetic men and women. But I, if you know that, I could just ignore the, the, the sex feature and do just as well. Mm. So, so again, synthetic data does something, but I would argue that except for very rare situations where you know something else about the world that the synthetic data can incorporate, you must well use original data. The synthetic data, there's no more information than you have when you train it. So. Yeah. You know, this is an interesting thing because uh, this has been a question that's been popping around in multiple different areas. And, and they're all talking about why can't we just create our synthetic data? Um, uh, but I, uh, so, so it's great uh, that this question has come up. Yes. And, um, and it's good to hear your answer. Um, on a slightly related uh, point, um, I have a question about bias in machine learning. So uh, obviously we, we, we heard about all the bias in terms of feature ex extraction, especially for persons who um, are black or brown yes. in, um, uh, in, um, uh, you know, in um, recognition of uh, individuals. But that's one thing. Um, can you talk about bias in general um, from, a, from uh, you know, obviously there's a social aspect, but from a scientific aspect as well. And how do you how do you eliminate how do you minimize that in machine learning? So bias has many means. Bias are sort of the the prior assumptions you have in the world. The, the priors, if you're a Bayesian about the world, <clears throat> what the world looks like. Uh, so there's there's something called the no free lunch theory that says if I give you a data set and say tell me about the, that data, you can give a good answer. Yeah. What about data I haven't seen? Well, for every model I can build that makes this one true, I can build a parallel model that makes that guy false. So in general, if I, if I have no bias, I can't do any generalization. The generalization requires some assumptions. That, again, I drew a picture and you had, remember the line that went down across from there? And I said, you know, how could it possibly be positive? Well, you could imagine that the negative examples are this body plus this particular example. Mm -hmm. Now, you can imagine that, that most people don't get sick, except for people who are over 50 who have this condition and that condition and these two other ones. And that particular things that all work together that make this person get sick also. Mm -hmm. But I said, let's ignore that. Let's assume it doesn't happen. And that's an assumption. It's a strong assumption. It assumes the world is simple at some level. And right. that's what bias is. So <clears throat> before the discussion about social issues of bias, I would say machine learning, the bias is essential. Now, what bias is the right bias in terms of getting good answers? That's an interesting machine learning question. Right. Now, the other half of the question, <clears throat> if I train a model on, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm white, I'm Caucasian, and I'm a male. You train on people like me, it will learn the features of white males. Mm -hmm. And other white males will do really well. But people who aren't male, who aren't white, it won't work. 
Mm. And that's because Statistics 101, I want to build a tool that works in a certain area, train on the same type of data. If I want a tool that works in Edmonton, train on Edmonton data. If I train Edmonton data and try and Calgary, that doesn't mean it's going to work. If I train Edmonton data, Edmonton and Calgary data and say, is it going to work in Uganda? Well, it might, but the statistical assumptions don't work. Right. Like the example I was given, if you want to work on white males, good, we can do it. Yeah. If you want to work on non-white, non-males, then you should train with that. Mm. Now, what if you can't? Where if there aren't those samples? Now, back to the question, could I generate you know, synthetic individuals which have the properties that I want that match what the distribution should look like? Should I can generate the instances? Can I get the label for those people? Mm. It's not so clear. Mm. I think it's yeah. even more complicated because uh, <clears throat> you know, all the issues of recidivism, you know, who's gonna, who is going to go back to jail? Right. If you look at the statistics, it says one thing. The statistics are you know, accurately reflect what's happened in the past. Right. Is that what we should be using? That's an important question. I would argue we shouldn't be using it because the previous data, given the biases there, show that there are more blacks who go back to jail right. for reasons that are not because not because of what they did, it's because of the way the society looks at yeah. this. So a model based on data will have these bad biases, bias we shouldn't have. Right. How do you address that? Um, <clears throat> my colleague, uh, Nettie Hanked, is, is her research is on the exact this topic, and there's some brilliant ideas about how to cope yeah. with that, but uh, yeah. I'll leave it to people smarter than me. Well, you know, there are, a lot of, uh, there are a couple of questions that have come up that perhaps to a certain extent uh, uh, relate to that. One is from Roger Dixon, and, and this is a question that I had, and that is the size of your test data uh, or the size of your training data versus the size of your test data. And it's, and it's 80%, 20%. And I've always wondered how that is good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so Roger has, you know, asked, so what recommendations would you uh, provide for determining the best sample sizes for the prediction, for prediction sizes? The smart algae answers. Use the one that works best. That doesn't help anybody. <clears throat> what do people use? Uh, it really depends on the characteristics of the field, uh, of the particular domain. Um, so I'm, I'm being old school. Do people know what, know what this is? Uh, okay. It's a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper. <laughs> it's a piece of paper. Computer printout from back when I was growing up. Oh, I see. It's got an X and a Y somewhere. Okay. Yeah. So, so, now, so now I draw a little curve here. Okay, I see. Um, I see. If, if, so this is a curve that characterizes typical learning performance. It gets better with, this is the number of data we get better and better. Hmm. So now the question is, if I curve, another four or five hmm. data points is not going to change the accuracy very much. So it's fine. To use tenfold cross validation or fivefold cross validation, or whatever, right? even just a holdout set. If I'm over here, if the data I have puts me over here for this curve, a few more data points will make a huge difference. Mm. So 80% is our rule of thumb, it's at least a fivefold cross validation and so forth. Is that the right answer? Sometimes leave one out cross validation is a better answer. I've got 50 examples and use 49 to train, you know, and the 50th to look at. Is this a universal truth? Did Russ say always use 80%? Mm -hmm. No. <clears throat> What's the best answer? There is, as you're, as you're suggesting, I've got this much data to play with. And if I use this much to train, I get a better model, but I only have that much left over to test on, which means I won't be able to evaluate the yeah. model very well. If I use this much to train, I've got I'll have a poor, a poorer estimate of how good mm -hmm. the model is. So Cross-validation tries to blur out some of that average. What's best? Um, the other thing is, if you believe statistics, if you're doing like fiber cross-validation, 10 fold cross-validation, if you believe statistics, you're going to get error bars. And you can sort of trust those error bars. So right. it won't make that much difference. So I'm a fan of 10 fold, of five fold cross-validation, but. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a good yeah. answer. I am, I know we're a little bit over time, but this next question is related to, to bias to a certain extent. And, and or, or, you know, to a more general um, uh, aspect. And, and, it, and basically, uh, this is from Michelle Gauthier. Do you include social information in medical mm -hmm. diagnosis data, including 
income, uh, region, background, probably even faith and what have you. <clears throat> is that included at this time? Is it or should it? Okay. Uh, a lot yeah, of times well, it's not uh, yeah. me. Um, I am white. Uh, that's a fact about me. The genes that made me who I am, that indicate my skin color, are also evidence of the disposition I might have to certain diseases. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you include my SNPs, my genetic profile, that can be very valuable. Mm -hmm. Is it legal to do that? Well, it depends. <clears throat> the food I eat might be indicative of different things in my gut microbiome, which might be related. Mm -hmm. And ethnicity might identify the foods I'm likely to eat. Um, should I include that? Again, question one, to get the best possible diagnosis, what should I include? And my answer to that is everything you got. Mm -hmm. Include ethnicity, include food, include everything else. And again, as a researcher, okay, well, I got a, a narrow line to walk. Uh, I guarantee you, I really don't care that this person has AIDS or that person is sick. As a researcher, they're just descriptions of individuals. I want to make the best possible answer for them. Mm -hmm. The question of, well, gee, am I allowed to ask that? Uh, if I don't ask someone's ethnicity, I might not know if they have this particular allele in their gene, which might be very indicative. You know, Ashkenazi Jews that have a predisposition towards breast cancer. If you don't get to ask if they're Jewish or Ashkenazi by heritage, you won't. You might not look for that. You might not have that as one tricks in your arsenal. Um, I happen to be Ashkenazi Jewish, by the way, but, yeah. but that's, that's just- But it's an, it's, it's an interesting question because it, um, it also, um, it gives you more scientific information, but there's also that bias that comes in. So what is that balance, right? So that would be, that would be quite interesting. But, uh, you know, I know we can discuss this for a long time. And, and um, Russ, um, uh, this was just absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for giving um, uh, this talk and, you know, spending uh, uh, the uh, part of your Friday afternoon with us. But this was uh, absolutely fabulous. And, and hopefully we'll have you again and again okay. uh, for, for future talks. Love Thank you so much uh, to you and to everyone for uh, being here uh, today. And thanks for the great questions. And thanks for the answer. We'll see you guys.